on May the 9th, 1970, local businesswoman and future political great Carrie J. Mays met with Grover Oatman and the county coroner here at W.H. Mays Mortuary. Later, she would call to her funeral home the Reverend Charles Spencer Hamilton, pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church, as well as local political official Grady Abrams. She wanted to show them the body of 16-year-old Charles Oatman. What they saw, as Grady Abrams would later describe, shook him to his core. The bruises, the badly beaten body of Charles Oatman, it shocked them. Yet it didn't jive with the story that county officials told earlier that he had died in the county jail when he fell off his bunk. No, what they saw looked like a brutal beating and killing. Cigarette burns, fork marks all throughout the young man's body, as well as gashes in the back of his head. Grady Abrams needed some questions answered by county officials. He began to strategize to meet with the county officials to get the answer to some of these questions. First of all, either one or two things occurred. Either the county officials were simply negligent in allowing this young boy to be killed in the county jail, or they were complicit. He wanted to find out what was going on. But as Grady Abrams began to plan his strategy, something else was afoot in the city of Augusta. By that evening, from Gwinnett Street to Old Town, Turpin Hill to the campus of Payne College, word began to spread of what had happened, what had truly happened to Charles Oatman. And activists began to mobilize. For many Payne College activists and many city activists, the time for talk was behind them. Now, it was time for action. And on May 10th, 11th, and 12th, Augusta, Georgia would never be the same. On Sunday, May 10th, 1970, the news of the death of Charles Oatman had spread quickly. By the evening, approximately 400 people met at May Park across the street from the county jail demanding answers. Leon LaRue, committee of 10 member, explained to everyone the grim sight that he'd seen at May's mortuary, stating that if they did not get answers, they would take down the jail brick by brick. Sheriff Atkins had mobilized as well. He positioned his men behind their patrol cars and on the roof of the jail, armed and ready for anything. As tensions grew, the crowd began to thin, though some individuals who stayed behind demanded that the jail be stormed immediately. Sensing that this would cause a bloodbath, principal at A.R. Johnson Junior High, Dr. Ike Washington, suggested that a delegation be formed to enter the jail and get answers. He, along with Grady Abrams, Leon LaRue, and a few other men were suggested for this council. They entered the jail and were met by the sheriff, the DA, and the local jailer. The story had been that Charles Oatman had fallen off of his bunk and died. Now, when pushed for answers, Sheriff Atkins insisted that it was fellow inmates who tortured and murdered Oatman. This answer raised a few questions. The marks on Oatman's body suggested that he'd been beaten for weeks and weeks and weeks. So if it was by the hands of his fellow inmates, did the jailers hear this beating? Did they hear him screaming, asking for help? If they did, why didn't they do any, anything? The delegation pushed further. And though they didn't get the answers they wanted that night, it was suggested that they meet with councilmen the next day at the municipal building to talk about jail conditions. LaRue and Abrams were charged with relaying this information to the crowd waiting outside. 
it was met with mixed reactions. Some cried that this was an outrage, that they should still storm the jail. Others suggested that they wait until further investigation. Ultimately, it, did, it was decided that they meet for a demonstration the next day, May 11th, at the municipal building. But for now, they'd go down, they'd reconvene at Tabernacle Church, a mile and a half away. We're standing in the sanctuary of Tabernacle Baptist Church. It's, it's around nine o'clock on Sunday evening, May 10th. Hundreds of people are gathering in the sanctuary for an impromptu, specially called mass meeting. For 85 years, Tabernacle had been a pillar of Augusta's black community. It had played an essential role in Augusta's civil rights movement. In the 1960s, it had been a key site of organizing and mass meetings of the movement. Dr. King had spoken here, and the church's minister in the 1960s, Reverend C.S. Hamilton, had also been president of the local NWCP chapter. And now on Sunday night, it once again played an essential role in the drama of May 11th and 12th, 1970. Earlier that day in the afternoon, five black leaders had met here at the church with Reverend Hamilton. Daniel Cross, president in 1970 of the NWCP chapter, Wilbur Allen, leader of Augusta's Black Panther Party, Leon LaRue, John Young, and John Warren, all leaders in the Committee of Ten. They represented the spectrum of movement activism in Augusta, from the civil rights approach of the NAACP and SCLC to the Black Power visions of the Black Panther Party and the Payne Student Militants, to the middle way of the Committee of Ten. Charles Oatman's brutal death had brought them together in solidarity and common cause, just as it had brought many of Augusta's Black citizens together and solidarity and common cause. As they met that afternoon, it was important to them to establish, make plans to establish a rumor center here at the church. A lot of stories were circulating in the community by word of mouth about what had been done to Charles Oatman, a lot of speculation. They were determined to find out what actually had been happened, what actually had happened, and to give that information to the people. White media and white officials could not be trusted to come up with honest answers. And so they laid plans to establish a rumor center here. It was also that afternoon meeting that they had called for the demonstration that night at eight o'clock, the previous segment at the county jail. The goal was to mobilize people promptly and put pressure on white officials to give honest answers to what had been done to Charles Oatman. We know from the previous segment that tensions were very high at the jail demonstration. Many left the meeting with feelings of intense frustration and indignation and county officials had kicked the can and had threatened violence throughout the meeting. Now, as people came here, they brought those feelings here. They were joined by hundreds of other people from the communities. The numbers swelled to around 800 people in the sanctuary. Reverend Hamilton began the meeting with a brief devotion. Grady Abrams, committee of 10 leader, also a city councilman, described to the group what he had personally seen on Saturday night at May's mortuary for those not at the county jail demonstration, he described the, the scene at the jail demonstration. And then the floor was simply open. Many, many people spoke. And they gave vivid stories of their experiences of police brutality, of how they had been wrongfully arrested for crimes of which they were not guilty, how they had been mistreated by police and by jail officials. The sharing of stories, the communal outpouring of grievances, these were classic solidarity building exercises that had been such a vital part of the civil rights movement. Again, this went on for several hours. As midnight approached, the plan to meet at the municipal building the next day was announced. The delegation from the jail was meeting with county officials and it was important once again to have a show of force outside the building. And then around midnight, everyone saying we shall overcome and left the meeting. As Grady Abrams left the church, he felt a tension in the air. As Daniel Cross left the church, he felt that something could happen that very night. The premonitions they had were palpable. As it turned out, it wouldn't happen that very night, but it would indeed in earnest the following afternoon. On May 11th, 
1970. The largest uprising in the South during the modern civil rights movement took place in the city of Augusta, Georgia. Long simmering racial tensions within the city came to a head when many black Augustans heard of the brutal killing of the young Charles Oakman in the county jail. On May 11, a small delegation from the black community met with county officials here at the municipal court building. While they were meeting on the inside, roughly 300 protesters began to assemble around 3 o'clock p.m. outside of the municipal court building. They began to talk amongst themselves and they began to wait because they wanted to see if things would be different this time around. The stonewalling they were used to in the past, there had to be something different this time. And that's what they wanted to wait and hear and see. Paying college student and local activist Oliver Polk, along with several others, took it upon themselves to take down the Georgia flag and set it on fire. To add to the tension, local police officers armed with shotguns were at the ready waiting to see if something would happen. When the local delegation came down, many of the protesters were, as we say, not pleased with some of the answers from the county commissioners. The stonewalling, as they characterize it, seemed to come around again. And to many, there had to be other alternatives. According to Oliver Pope, this meant war. The community is little more than a group of diverse persons with some common characteristic. It could be culture, it could be language, it could be a physical trait. But within a community are subgroups, those that are more tightly woven together. Maybe that they share the same neighborhood of a particular city or they grew up on the same block of a subdivision. Well, although ideologically different, the news about Charles Oatman affected the black community and unified it. But ideologically, differences still remain. There were some who aligned themselves with a nonviolent civil rights approach, some who aligned with the Committee of Ten's middle of the road, and some who believed like Pope that there was time to go to war. After dispersing from the municipal building, some went home frustrated and disappointed. Others headed Pier, the Gwinnett and Knife. Some went to go get their guns, some went to strategize, and some went to Broad Street. Now while on Broad, some vending machines were turned over. JC Penney's windows had its displays messed up a little, but there wasn't any real damage and the show of force was small. Reflecting on this, Tim Saunders noted that it was cultural conditioning. Understanding and attacking white people's property in the white space of Broad Street was simply too dangerous. It was too off limits. Really, it's the symbolism of indignation. It's the mindset of the oppressed. You don't touch masses' profit. So the group starts to come down 9th South, away from Broad to reassemble with a group that met here at Gwinnett and they become more emboldened. A rock is thrown at a city bus that's headed toward a white neighborhood. Windows are broken of motorist cars and near the corner of 9th and Walton Way, a contingent of police are met with a brick hurled at the back windshield of a squad car. Roscoe Williams recounts that while taking his daughter for a walk, stood in between the crosshairs with anxiety of a large gathering mob and a police officer with a raised weapon. Once the group reassembled at 9th and Gwinnett, the gathering had grown. More new faces from the neighborhood, many of them being teenagers. Young people who could see themselves in the face of Charles Oakman and could see their future in his death. Huey Newton tells us that revolution is for the young. At some point, another confrontation with a white police officer ensues. This time as the group moves towards his squad, squad car, instead of him driving away, he chooses to step out, brandish a high-powered rifle, and aim it at the group. After a waited pause, 
the officer elects to get back into his vehicle and sped away. In a community that police ruled like a plantation, where they act as overseers, where recently, nine days ago, two officers threw Ted Bowman through a storefront window, where Wilbur Allen verbally slapped the bully, trying to invigorate a sense in Black folks in this community to not be afraid. This was a deeply symbolic moment that a group that felt confident could stand up against an armed white officer. Maybe because it was the familiarity of these streets, maybe it was a newfound confidence in the size of their group, but they had demonstrated that they were unafraid. The group began to throw rocks at white tourists. Driving through their neighborhood, they shattered windshields. And in at least two instances, one involving a 65-year-old white woman driving down Gwinnett toward University Hospital, and another with a 56-year-old white man who had stopped in front of A.R. Johnson, both of whom were pulled from their vehicles and beat. Sanders recounted he saw the beating of the man, and he knew that it was not right. But he also said that he understood that where that rage came from was from the system. It was bred out of a rage against a feeling of being inferior. Later on that evening, Sanders witnessed another event with a white officer who had rode a motorcycle into the neighborhood, but he abandoned it as he was surrounded by a group and fearfully climbed up a tree. He noted that one demonstrator sat on the motorcycle and mocked the officer and asked him, how long have you been on the job? Some in the group began to ransack stores, both white-owned and Chinese-American. They were stealing products, breaking windows, leaving the stores in disarray. The Dixie Bend service station at the corner of 9th and Gwinnett, the Gwinnett Pharmacy, and the red and white market on the 800 block of Gwinnett, Snow's Laundry on the 900 block, the Eugene Wu Bruce grocery store, and Hill's food stores on the 9th and Hopkins and 9th and DeAntonac were the earliest targets. These were businesses that didn't have good reputations in the community. Others, however, were left alone with it being noted not to touch those businesses because they patronized and supported this black community. Don't touch them, they're soul brothers, was the word that circulated about the merchants. A com commendation that said that the merchant was an ally, that they were not a member of the power struggle. Some merchants even began to write the word soul brother across their business and their storefronts to ensure that the businesses wouldn't be destroyed. But later, Molotov cocktails filled with gasoline from local service stations were hurled into white and Chinese American owned businesses in targeted acts of violence, creating now a system of firebombing. Some stores have been ransacked earlier, now caught fire. Others that had not previously been touched were also victimized. The Eugene Wu grocery store, Harlem pawn shop, Williams Beauty Supply, and all of the 1100 block of 9th were the first to burn. Some of the group moved north, back along 9th, towards Broad Street. It had been spoken about earlier of burning down Broad. And now this emboldened group might have the gumption necessary in order to be able to attack the economic epicenter of White Augusta. Are you getting that sign? My dad's been here for fifty years on the hill. And store here. You don't have any idea who did it or why? No, no idea at all. Do you have insurance? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> you can kill yours. Oh, that is the same. As the sun rose on that Tuesday morning, news would travel to the local community and the nation about the Augusta Six, the unarmed black men who were killed. I am Nefertiti and I am on the 1970 Augusta Riot Steering Committee. And we're located not far from the Rosa T. Beard Memorial Bridge 
at the intersection of 15th Street and Poplar Street. And we would like to say the names of the Augusta Six. And as we memorialize their deaths, we'd like to share about their lives. Charlie McMurphy and his wife Lillian had three daughters and a son. Both of his parents lived in Augusta. A native of rural Burke County, he had moved to Augusta for work and in 1970 was employed at a furniture store. He had kept his church membership in Burke County at Rosier Grove Baptist Church. 18-year-old William Wright Jr. was the oldest of 10 children of Dorothy and William Wright Sr. They lived in the Delta Manor housing project and William was working at Augusta Roofing. His four grandparents were still living. With his family, he went to Moses Baptist Church and his younger sister, Grace, remembers him as religious, hardworking, and eager for civil rights change. 20-year-old Sammy McCullough was one of eight children of Sammy and Ruth McCullough. His mother worked a service job at Payne College and the family lived in the Gilbert Manor housing project. His maternal grandmother and paternal grandfather were still living. With his family, he went to Antioch Baptist Church. 19-year-old John Stokes was one of seven children of James and Martha Stokes. His maternal grandmother was still living and one of his brothers was fighting in Vietnam. The family lived in the May Park neighborhood and with his family, John attended Hale Street Baptist Church. 28-year-old John Bennett and his wife, Lilla Sue, were raising two daughters and a son. They lived in the Sand Hills neighborhood and were members of Cumming Grove Baptist Church. His parents also lived in Sand Hills. 45-year-old Mac Wilson was a veteran of World War II and an employee of the city of Augusta. Like Charlie Murphy, he was a native of Burke County and had moved to Augusta for work. He had lived in Augusta since 1950. He was married to Linda Ann and had a daughter. His mother was still alive and lived in Burke County. The police killings of these six men left grieving widows, children, parents, grandparents, siblings, and friends. We will now partake in an African tradition called the libation ceremony in which we will say the names of the Augusta Six and we will declare our intentions for healing over this community. In the presence of God and creation and in honor of our ancestors, we would like to pour out water in memory of Charlie Mac Murphy. In memory of William Wright Jr. In memory of Sammy McCullough. In memory of John Stokes. in memory of John Bennett, in memory of Mac Wilson, we would like to pour out water because we would like to flood the atmosphere with love and truth. We would like to wash away silencing shame. We would like to clean and purify our community of corruption and injustice. And we would like to hydrate and nurture seeds of hope, liberation, 
unity, and justice. I would like to become a vessel of the intentions that I just declared. And I invite anyone watching at this moment, wherever you are, if you feel compelled to also become a vessel of healing and of truth. Ashe. We remember the Augusta Six. I'm standing here in the vestibule of True Vine Missionary Baptist Church, the church that held the funeral of Charles Oatman on May 13th, 1970. When Charles died, he was 16 and he was a student at A.R. Johnson. And that death left a hole in the lives of a lot of people. This church, relatively small church, was packed to the brim with people coming to mourn his life. So there was a tension in the air at this funeral. But that didn't stop the family from honoring Charles as he well should have been. His casket was a lovely dark bronze, very elegant, it had a satin inlay. And apparently next to the casket was a bouquet, an arrangement of roses in the shape of a heart. And on top of his casket, when he was carried out, were white and red carnations. Charles, Charles's death is what prompted people to really rally together against racial injustice, against white supremacy. And while his name may be familiar to some, by and large at the time, all he was, was a black boy who'd been killed at the county jail. And so in this video, I'd like to talk to you about who he really was. He was not Charles o Oakman, as some news reports listed it. He was not Robert Oatman, as others had it. He was Charles Oatman, and he was born in Burke County to Katie Mercier. When he was about two, Cornelia and Grover Oatman adopted him and brought him here to Augusta. They didn't live too far from this church and they were parishioners here, regular members. Lenton Oatman was his uncle and he has memories of Charles playing with his hair when he came to visit one time. He just woke up and found little fingers playing in his hair and met his, his nephew for the first time. Charles was a delicate boy. He was always small for his age. And he was also intellectually disabled. He had about the um, capacities of a second grader. It, it took him a good long time to learn how to tie his shoes, according to Lenton. Lenton had a special relationship with Charles. They would go fishing and Charles really enjoyed just sitting at those at the riverside. He also, with his uncle, would go to the corner store for sweets. And that was a very special thing, a secret between him and his uncle. Because like most mothers, Mrs. Oatman didn't like her son having too many sweets. Lenton describes Charles as a particularly sensitive boy. If a car backfired, a door slammed, someone yelled, he would he would curl up. He would he might jump or, or hide, but startling noises were difficult for him. Too much stimulation was hard for him to handle. When Charles died and his funeral was brought here, I'm sorry, when his 
and his body was brought here. This sanctuary was filled to the brim. It was packed wall to wall. Outside of it, there were National Guardsmen on the roof surrounding the church. There were also policemen and reporters trying to sneak looks in. The National Guard said that they were concerned that there would be another riot as a result of the emotion coming out of this funeral. But there was also a very big concern about white vigilantism, that there may be firebombs or attacks at this church because that had happened many times in the past. Thankfully, neither of those things happened and the family took Charles's body to Flat Rock Cemetery in Matthews, Georgia, where he was laid to rest along, along with many other Oatmans. And his parents, Cornelia and Grover, lay just beneath him. And that's where he will be, as well as in my heart, and I hope yours as well. Yeah. Remove that foot. Thank you. 